Hi there, it's Dr. Zoe, your life and Grab relationship Grab a cup coach. of tea or if listen you as you go, woman, ladies. You've come this is to your the right hour place. with Dr. Zoe, I believe that your life and relationship coach, with encouragement, on point insight, it, it, inspiring it guests, the world. health tips, you need and advice. Dr. Zoe helps busy women keep their mind in the game by redefining your superwoman. And You're listening to The Dr. Zoe Show. Go get on my newsletter where I send out a lot of encouragement to all you super women out there holding it down. And yes, you are. So today I'm going to start with my superwoman win and my superwoman bomb. And I use that word fail or superwoman fail, bomb, whatever. I use it with so much respect because I believe that talking about our failures is not a negative thing, ladies. We gain wisdom from learning from our failures. We gain wisdom for sure, but sometimes it's so much easier and smarter to gain it from learning from other people's failures. So I'm helping you out by sharing mine. And I'm also just letting you know, we are all a work in progress. At this point in my life, I'm really embracing that whole concept of failing fast and failing forward. So if you can really see your failures as a lesson, then you don't have to fear them. You try things, you fail quickly, and then that way you can just get onto your win. Failing fast, failing forward, it helps you embrace that part of our life, the ups and downs, the failures. So my superwoman win this week, I'm kind of excited about this one. My daughter, my five-year-old started reading this week and it was kind of like a light bulb thing. She's the fourth one that I homeschooled. And so yesterday, it was just yesterday, it clicked and she read her first two sentences. And I just saw that light bulb and everything just, you know, ignite with her. And it was just so exciting. And actually this is the only one of my children I wrote down. This is the day she started reading. So I can remember it forever. And it's really a win for me because like I said, she's the fourth one that I've homeschooled. And I've always like said that my first kids, my son Kai and Sage, they're the ones I practice with. So eventually I'm, you know, I can get it right with the following kids. And with my first Kai, I homeschooled, you know, him and I was so uptight, like all new moms are, right? We're so uptight. Everything's so important. And we can look back and go, oh my gosh, I wish I would have just relaxed and just known that, you know, they're going to get potty trained. They're going to eat solid food. They're going to walk. They're going to do all those things. And if you can just relax and same thing with teaching your kids, they're going to learn how to read. It's going to happen. But I was so uptight for it with him and I pushed him so much. And then my next child, Sage, he was a, he was a later reader. And what's funny is he loves to read and he's written a book, my 14 year old, but he didn't really start to read well till he was about seven or eight. And I was really worried and I didn't trust the process with him. And then my next daughter, Sally, she has special needs. And so that was a whole nother different process. And so I was determined with Sig, Siggy, my, my five-year-old to really trust the process, to not push her too much and also not hold her back, find opportunities and pour into her when those opportunities were there and pull back. So I feel like this is the time I really got it right. It's this whole reading thing. It's been totally painless and enjoyable. And so that's my superwoman win. And as an encouragement for you moms, trust the process with your kids. They are going to learn as long as you know you're doing what you're supposed to do and pouring into them. It's going to come along. So my superwoman fail for the week. I forgot to remind my sick husband to pick up my daughter from school. So he was sick and I think I was either coming here to the station or I was going to my office. I can't remember. Those are the two uh, days that I work out of the week. And I knew he was really sick, but I had to go to work. And I told him, you know, I'll call you and remind you to go pick her up. And so he's like, okay. And I was working, got on the phone. I don't remember what happened, but all of a sudden it was the time to pick my daughter up and I had forgotten and I called him. Luckily, he got there. It was fine, but that's my superwoman fail. Got lots of kids, too busy, you forget. She got picked up a tiny bit late. It was all okay, though. So today, I'm excited about our topic. We're welcoming back Amy Barnett from Making Peace with the Pantry. Amy is a holistic health and fitness coach. She helps women end their struggle with food and weight. Amy, welcome. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here. I'm excited to be here too. And I'm excited. I don't know. Did I talk to you guys about the topic? (laughs) Our topic today is cravings. We're going to be talking about how you can identify your cravings using them instead of trying to push them away so that we can actually overcome. 
today. Yeah. And we're going to be talking about the 10 common causes of, tra- of cravings. But before we get started, Amy, you're a superwoman. Can you tell us what your superwoman win and fail is for the week? You bet. Okay. So my win was just over the weekend. We had our, I hosted our, my first health and wellness event. It went really well. There was some planning involved, lots of outreach to people and it went really well. And the information presented received very well. So I was very excited about that. That's a big win. Yeah, that was a big win. And my fail was I overscheduled myself. So, um, especially as I was prepping for this big event, I had so much to do and I had committed to volunteering in my daughter's class, but you know, you can't be in two places at the same time. So I had to let one thing go. And I felt like my daughter was, was really disappointed, but, Mm. um, I couldn't be in two places at one time. So that was probably my fail over scheduling. I get it. And that's funny that you say that because I think I talked about that last week, which might be on the podcast today about that whole thing of, you know, having to miss kids stuff sometimes when you're a busy superwoman, it happens, but yeah, we all have them. We've all been there, but congratulations on your event. That's awesome. Thanks. So I'm so glad to have you back because we need to talk about these cravings and we're not just (laughs) going to be talking about food cravings. We're going to be talking about all the cravings we have in our life, like shopping, wine, relationship, all kinds of fun things. But you wrote a book, and what's the name of your ebook? It's called Conquer Your Cravings. Right. Yes. So and how to use your cravings to achieve your health and weight loss goals. Because as you as you were mentioning, I think it's not a matter of overcoming them per se. It's really a matter of using them and learning to leverage them to your advantage. Absolutely. So let's talk about those. What would you say? And we'll start with food because you know it's the new year. We're all trying to get on top of our food, exercise. We have those goals. What would you say are those 10 common causes of craving? Yeah, in the ebook, I identified 10. And mm-hmm. one of them, the first one I talked about was blood sugar. If your blood sugar crashes. Mm-hmm. And then was how do we know our blood sugar is crashing? Like, how, how would you know that? Well, you would, a lot of times you'll feel drained, you'll feel tired. You know that word hangry? Uh-huh. Um, <laughs> that, that's a pretty good explanation for how you feel when your blood sugar crashes. But a lot of times what happens though, is you get really strong cravings for refined carbohydrates because your body is trying to recover mm-hmm. your blood sugar. And so it's sending you these cues to eat and to eat fast. And it wants to pick something that's going to recover your blood sugar quickly. And I really think that's fascinating because when you take a step back and you realize just how smart your body is, your body's trying to prevent you from starving. Mm. It's trying to prevent you from going into this crisis mode. And regulate you, yeah. And so when we know, okay, I just, I want some bread, I want some chips, I want whatever those carbs are, sugar drinks, what then should we try to do instead of we recognize, okay, maybe this is a sugar low. So here's the thing. Like when our blood sugar crashes, uh-huh. like all willpower completely goes out the window uh-huh. because again, your body thinks it is a matter of survival and it wants you to eat and it wants you to eat fast. So in that particular moment, you know, you almost, you, you just go for the bread or, or go for, you know, the thing that's going to lift you up. You know, of course, you know, picking fruit over refined carbohydrate is going to be a better bet. But I think the best thing that we can do is actually set ourselves up so that it doesn't happen in the first place. Mm -hmm. So if we can learn to balance our blood sugar and be proactive about balancing our blood sugar, then we're not going to experience that crash. We're not going to put ourselves in that position to really fight against ourselves. Right. Okay. That makes sense. And we balance our blood sugar by eating more regularly, right? Not starving ourselves. Yes. And balancing your macronutrients. I talk about that in the book, but- Mm -hmm. I call it, you know, balance your F to the C to the P. You've got to balance your fat. You've got to balance your carbohydrates and your protein. That's a big one. Yeah. And so I always ask myself that question of, do we crave things our bodies need? And I've been doing a little bit of research on it. And some of the research says, no, not really. Because a lot of things we tend to crave are things that aren't good for us. But I know that, and maybe it's if you really know your body well, you're really in tune with your body because I know that I crave things that I need. And I've figured that out even by blood tests and things. Like when I'm super craving meat, my iron's low. I'll notice that I'm craving things. And I know it's because my body hasn't gotten them in a long time. But then of course, we also have those crazy cravings. Like I'm sure I don't need ice cream. 
Yes, absolutely. And I, there are so many different layers, but mm-hmm. I think, you know, one of the biggest things we can do is we can begin to look at our cravings as messages, as these little, I like to say they're little notes to myself. They're like these little cues that are telling me, okay, your body must need something because mm-hmm. at all times, you know, we want to be in balance and our body seeks to, you know, balance and equilibrium. And right. so it's going to crave whatever it needs in order to establish balance. And I think when we can take that perspective, then that's when we can begin to, you know, try to figure out, okay, well, it, what is it that my body is trying to tell me? Is it like a true nutrient deficiency or, you know, am I hungry for something other than food? Right. Am I, you know, it's an emotional craving or am I stressed, you know? Okay. So I want to talk in a few minutes about like what we can do about it, but let's go ahead and run through those 10 common cravings. So the first one is sugar low, right? Our blood blood sugar is low. What are the next ones? So the next one is all about nutrients and nutrition. Mm -hmm. So, you know, like your example with craving meat and Mm -hmm. having low iron, that's Mm -hmm. a perfect example of, you know, a nutrient deficiency. Right. Another one would be, I call it your yin is out of balance with your yang. Mm -hmm. And that's um, going back to Chinese medicine because- in Chinese medicine, the foods that are cool and expansive are considered to have yin qualities, whereas the foods that are warm and contracting are considered to have yang qualities. And and what they say is that if we eat too much of one type of food, then we will have cravings for the other type of food. That's so, very interesting. And you know, my mom loves super hot drinks and she's always drinking super hot drinks. And I am the opposite. I like to drink like smoothies and frozen drinks. And I will drink them in the middle of winter when I'm freezing and I'll like cover myself up and turn the heat way up. Cause for some reason, my body likes cold stuff. So I've wondered about that. And then, especially when you talk about the yin and the yang, it's like, okay, I wonder how that applies. Yeah. I mean, that would be interesting for you to begin to kind of be paying attention to and see if you uncover anything, but the salt and sugar, salt and sugar is a, is a really common one. Mm -hmm. Um, which I found, I found to be fascinating. So, you know, they're considered to be opposite. So sure. sometimes if we have strong cravings for salt, it's because our diet is really high in added sugars uh, and the uh, opposite is true as well. Okay. Makes sense. And what would you say the and next ones are? If you're tired. That's a big one. Yeah. And when we're tired, we crave carbs too, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. And it's really interesting is that, you know, we have these, these hormones, your hunger and satiety hormones. Mm -hmm. And when you don't get enough sleep, that has a direct impact on those hunger and satiety cues. So what happens is if we don't get enough sleep, it causes us to feel more hungry and it also causes us to feel less satisfied. So that's proof enough for you to get some sleep. Especially the less satisfied part, because yes, I mean, I totally noticed that when I'm super tired, man, I just want to eat everything in the world. And yeah, you feel less satisfied. But I like how you talk about in your book too, which is so important. I need to hear it because I tend to really not sleep a lot or not, not sleep enough, I should say. And your point that you made that we are actually more productive when we sleep more, we trick ourselves into believing if we are, you know, cheating ourselves on our sleep, that we're being more productive and we aren't. In addition, we're also, you know, failing our health. So This is Dr. Zoe, and I'm here with my guest, Amy Barnett, and we are getting ready to go on a quick break, and we're going to come back and talk more about the causes of our cravings, and then we're going to talk about what to do about it. People ask me, how do you have so much energy? I am not a coffee drinker, but I love the benefits of matcha green tea. More antioxidants than coffee and a smooth energy, not the jittery kind that lasts me all day long. Perfect for you super moms too. I have searched the world over for that perfect matcha for my smoothies and I have found it at Kiss Me Organics. You can get it too at kissmeorganics.com. Enter the promo code Dr. Zoe, D R Z O E, for 10% off and free shipping. Experience the smooth, healthy, organic energy of matcha green tea. Kissmeorganics.com. Hi, it's Dr. Zoe. I'm back with my guest, Amy Barnett, health coach from Making Peace with the Pantry. And we are talking about the 10 common causes of cravings, and we're going to be talking about what in the world do you do about it? So Amy has just talked about some of the causes of cravings, low blood sugar, being too tired, being 
hangry, mal- like malnutrition, right? De- or nutrition deficit. <laughs> what are some of those other causes, Amy? Another one is all about your brain chemistry. So, uh-huh. you know, the ingredients in our food sometimes can hijack our brain mm, chemistry sure. and different people respond differently to the formulations in food, in the formulation of ingredients in foods. And for some people, those combinations can lead to continuous cravings, overeating, and sometimes compulsive eating and binge eating. So that's a big one. That's why I can't eat Doritos. Whatever they have in the, was it something DTQ, whatever it is, it's really bad and I will eat the whole bag. So yes. Yeah. And that, that saying, once you pop, you can't stop. Right. <laughs> So true. Um, yeah. So another one is the emotional craving aspect. So yeah. um, being hungry for something other than food. You know, a lot of times we call them emotional cravings. Mm-hmm. So, but I think these, you know, and as a woman who really struggled with her relationship with food, but then now also counsels women around that. You know, a lot of times, you know, these are the ones that are the hardest to wrap your head around, but these are also the most powerful. Right. And I, I like to tell people to think of them as a compass because they really can shed light and help you navigate this thing called life. So mm-hmm. um, they're actually a really beautiful thing. Yeah. And, you know, I would have to say that that's probably one of the most important ones for a number of reasons, but it, this is also the one I think that applies to all of our cravings in our life. You know, we are trying to fix something emotionally. We've got a hole and we're trying to fill it up. And we tend to first try to fill it up with the easiest thing that we can grab or get a hold of, whether it's wine or shopping or food or sex or relationships, whatever it is. But we do have to recognize that there's an emotional component of that, that we have to fix and we can fill up ourselves. So yes, that's a big one. And we'll, we'll come back to that one. Okay. So what are the other cravings? Just stress and overwhelm, that's another big one. A lot of times, you know, food can be a coping mechanism for, or just a way to kind of tune out in those feelings of stress and overwhelm. You know, there's something about the act of crunching and chewing that just floods your body with a sense of relief. And a lot of times that's a big one. Yes. I mean, that's all part of the emotional component of it. Yes, absolutely. Yes. Yes. What's the next one? Another one is your hormones. So, Mm. um, especially with our hormones fluctuating throughout the month. You know, Mm -hmm. there's these, I talk about it specifically in the ebook, but there's two big points in our menstrual cycle that Mm -hmm. really impact our cravings. And that's right before ovulation and then right before the start of our period. And Mm -hmm. I mean, I think most of us know, you know, right around the start of our period, we anticipate some of those strong cravings, especially for carbohydrates and things. But a lot of times we don't realize that mid cycle, we also have really strong cravings for carbohydrates as well. And so being mindful of that kind of helps things make sense because also, you know, in addition to our cravings for food, it also, it kind of messes with our body image too. So, you know, just the day before we might've been feeling really good in a pair of jeans, but then the next day we don't feel so good in that same pair of jeans. And it it could be related to that hormone fluctuation. Good point. And I definitely recognize that. And I've learned over the years instead of freaking out, like, why am I so hungry? Or why am I trying to eat all of this? I, I think of it as a wave. I'm like, you know what? It's, and when we talk about yep. the cycle, it's kind of like that, right? Let me just ride this out. I know I'm going to equal myself back out. I don't need to stress over it. It's something hormonal. So that's great that you pointed that out. Exactly. Yep. So ladies, we are talking with Amy Barnett, health and fitness coach from Making Peace with the Pantry. You can find her on Instagram and all places social, I believe, in her website at makingpeacewiththepantry.com. And we are finishing up talking about the 10 common causes of cravings. I don't know what number we're on. We have a couple more left, right, Amy? Yep, we're on number nine, I think. Okay, number nine. You are thirsty. Oh, yes. So that's a big one is our thirst because it's really common to mistake hunger for thirst because Mm -hmm. the same part of our brain regulates both signals. So I'm sure most people have heard, you know, that the trick feel hungry, try to drink a glass of water and then wait 20 minutes. Um, And that's a really great strategy. However, I can be the first one to say that that can be very difficult to do in the moment. So I definitely recommend, you know, just being mindful of your hydration, you know, again, kind of being proactive with it. Mm -hmm. I have a rule for myself, which works really well is I have this big tumbler. And my rule when I wake up in the morning is that whole thing has to be completed before I can eat anything. And it helps a lot. And that way I get my hydration taken care of early in the day. 
and I'm not getting to the end of the day and realizing, oh my goodness, I haven't had anything to drink and I'm, you know, going to eat chips. So yeah, yep. that's a good one. And number 10. The last one, I call it de-evolution. So I say uh-huh. you are de-evolving. And so, you know, sometimes when things are going really well, we sabotage ourselves and that's, you know, uh-huh. mainly because a lot of times, you know, it's the whole concept of change being right. different and uncomfortable. So even if, you know, we're adjusting to new eating and lifestyle habits and we feel different, even if it's a, a good feeling, sometimes that change is, you know, just uncomfortable. So we wind up sabotaging ourselves. So, right. And we have to know that not only does that sometimes happen, that almost all the time happens, because if you think of a system and our body is a system. It has a certain equilibrium and anytime you pull that equilibrium off, the system naturally pulls itself back to that natural balance. And so you have to know that's going to happen and you have to fight against it so that the system can create a new normal, a new equilibrium, but it does take time. And that's with any change in your life, ladies, any change, whether it's relationship or any change that you make in your life, that's going to happen. And sometimes the pool is from outside. And sometimes the pool is internal. So thank you. So those are the 10 common causes. Those are the reasons why we crave things. So now what do we do about it? How can we overcome or use those cravings, the knowledge of them to make differences in our life? Well, I think, you know, one of the biggest things we can do is we can really, you know, if we look at them as messages, as we begin to take, you know, this approach that, oh, my body's trying to tell me something. Mm -hmm. And then we get curious and inquisitive over what's happening, you know, then we can really make some progress. So I identify some action steps, but I think the first thing we should do is begin to just observe our behavior and, you know, really just let go of any guilt or judgment. I think, you know, that's so common is that we, you know, give ourselves a hard time or we think that something's wrong with us if we, you know, wind up giving into a craving. But you know, just really becoming, you know, very objective about what we're doing. And then once we do that, then if we can kind of start to peel back the layers and identify the root cause of the craving, you know, using those 10 that we talked about, and and that's not a comprehensive list. Those are just some of the 10 common ones that I've encountered with myself and, and the clients that I work with. But, you know, like once you can begin to figure out the root cause of the craving and whether or not you keep having them, just start to just be really curious and inquisitive about it. The thing is, is that when you talk about observing, it's so hard to observe yourself in the moment. And so I think what you have to do is go back and look. You have to yes. be a post observer, recognize the things that you do tend to do, and then take steps to prevent that from happening. Because in the moment, it's hard. And the other thing, when we talk about observing behavior in order for change, and this is for any issue that you have, sometimes I'll be working with people who have issues with being honest or lying. And I tell them what you need to do is when you see yourself doing it, actually work on taking it back. Now it's a lot harder with food because we don't want to, you know, binge and purge, but if you can look at it, post what you do, observe it, and then figure out how can I change that and stop it for next time? Right. Do you have some more insight about what observing means? Well, I actually, People would be surprised when I tell them to sort of lean into the craving, you know, because yeah, I, I heard actually you talk about that really recommend them. journaling and uh-huh. reflecting afterwards because, you know, like, yes, you, you objectively observe behavior. You're trying to figure out what's going on. But like if you have this intense craving, then I usually say, you know, lean into it. Let your, you know, give your body what it needs, but then really engage in reflection afterward. And you already kind of alluded to that because then what we can do is once we begin to figure out what's going on, then we can set ourselves up for success. We can be proactive and we can take steps so that we don't put ourselves in that position again. And when we do that regularly and consistently, then we don't wind up, you know, really sabotaging our goals. That's an interesting one. I'm struggling with that one right now because I'm just kind of thinking about it. When I hear giving into the craving, I guess I'm thinking okay, there's a conscious giving in, right? And then there's a unconscious. So when I talk about it being hard in the moment, if, because often we're not aware, I guess my thought is at what point, if your kind of rule for yourself is give in to the craving when you have it, at what point do we not give in? That's true. And I guess I'm such a proponent of reflection and I'm also such a proponent of 
this idea that if we can set ourselves up so that we don't have it in the first place, because that's mm-hmm. kind of where the power is, at least when it comes to, I believe, with food and the different sources that I identify, if we uh-huh. can set ourselves up so that we don't experience the craving in the first place, right. then we don't have to rely on willpower. We don't have to rely on this concept of self-control, you know, because we're not sabotaging ourselves and putting ourselves in a position to ultimately give in, if that makes sense. No, it does make sense. And I think, I mean, that's actually kind of the whole basis of psychotherapy is that over time, as you uncover and uncover and uncover, your behavior is going to naturally change. So that definitely makes sense. Although then on another level, I just think if there is any ability in you in the moment to not give in, then I would think you should take it because that's part of towards progress. But if you do, and often that part is that kind of the unconscious or the subconscious uh, behavior, then you need to give yourself grace and go back. And like you said, journal and observe and figure out what was going on in that moment. Love that. Okay. Okay. So that, that's some really good help for, okay, what do we do when we have these cravings? Do you have any other tips or suggestions for using the cravings to our benefit? I think it's always a great idea to get support mm. um, because I think sometimes we get caught in our own stuff, you know, mm-hmm. like, so having an outside objective perspective is always very useful in that as we engage in that reflection process. Great. Uh, yeah, no, I, absolutely. Accountability is so important too. So we're going to talk a little bit about that when we come back from our break. We are here with our guest and health and fitness coach, Amy Barnett. We'll be back in just a minute. People ask me, how do you have so much energy? I am not a coffee drinker, but I love the benefits of matcha green tea. More antioxidants than coffee and a smooth energy, not the jittery kind that lasts me all day long. Perfect for you super moms too. I have searched the world over for that perfect matcha for my smoothies and I have found it at Kiss Me Organics. You can get it too at kissmeorganics.com. Enter the promo code Dr. Zoe, D R Z O E, for 10% off and free shipping. Experience the smooth, healthy, organic energy of matcha green tea. Kissmeorganics.com. Hi there, it's Dr. Zoe. I'm back with my guest, Amy Barnett from Making Peace with the Pantry. And we are making peace today with our cravings and our vices, understanding why they're there and what we can do to utilize them for our success. So we've been talking about how do we stop giving in? And Amy, we were talking about setting ourselves up for success when it comes to overcoming some of those cravings. Yes, absolutely. So I'm such a firm believer in being proactive Mm -hmm. and doing whatever you can to avoid your trigger. And I think, you know, everyone's different, but the key is to be proactive regularly and consistently. Mm -hmm. So not just in that moment, but try to, you know, do this on a regular basis. And I think, you know, when you said at the very beginning, trust the process, Mm -hmm. when you were talking about your, your daughter and her reading, I think that's so true as we, you know, reflect and change in relation to our cravings. You know, my mom always told me that growth and change is it's sort of a, a two step forward, one step back kind of process. And yes, I think, you know, if we can remember that, yeah, there's going to be times when we can inch forward, but we're going to fall down. But if we can use those times when we fall down or, you know, we, we binge or we satisfy the craving or, or whatever it is, if we can use that as an opportunity to learn, then that's when we can really make progress. I think that might be the difference in, you know, giving into the craving versus, you know, like if we can, make a commitment to ourselves to use that as an opportunity to grow. That might be the biggest difference. I think it does make the biggest difference. And you know, what happens is we, we take two or three or four steps forward and then we take one step back and we feel like we've destroyed the whole thing instead of recognizing, wait, I'm further, I'm further ahead than I was even with this one step back. And now it's time to regroup and figure out how to continue moving forward. And that's part of trusting the process. I love that. So true. So true. So thank you, Amy, for sharing these tips and your book. How can people get a hold of your book? And can you say the name of your book again? 
You bet. It's called Conquer Your Cravings. Mm-hmm. And if you go to my website, which is makingpeacewiththepantry.com, there's actually a, a little red button at the very top that says, you know, download the free ebook. And what's really great is when you download the ebook, then it's almost like a little mini course because I try to support you around the content in the ebook and help give you tips and strategies each week to help you really implement all the stuff that we talk about in the book. Mm, that's awesome. Great. So women can get that by going to your website, making peace with the pantry.com. And thank you so much. So I'm going to be talking a little bit and you can uh, jump in here, Amy, but I'm going to be talking about some of our other cravings besides just food. So one of the big one is shopping. And so all of those 10 causes that you just talked about certainly apply when we talk about craving to, you know, why we want to do things. But with shopping, I think there's a specific thing and that has to do with the fact that we, by our nature as humans, are hunter gatherers. It's in our DNA. And so we don't get to do that much anymore. There's actually really no place in our life that we hunt or gather things. And when I talk, when you think about, okay, well, the grocery store, well, you go to the grocery store, it's so mundane. It's the same thing. There's no sense of chase. There's no sense of, you know, I'm looking for this and I'm going to find it. It's like, we all know where stuff is, right? I mean, sometimes we do, but we just ask the guy. But shopping for women, I think for sure, man, that can feel good when you're looking for something and, oh, it's in your size or when you find a really good deal. And so we have to understand that in some way that's hardwired into us and we get a fix. We get a, we get a high sometimes from shopping. But of course, it costs money and it can be detrimental to us. And that's why we tend to crave it. And just like Amy was talking about the emotional craving, shopping, yeah, it fills that hunter-gatherer portion as well, but it also fills some of those emotional cravings. And there's been research about shopping too. Of, you know, when we buy something, what happens to our brain? It ignites, you know, parts in our brain that really for us feel like we are taking care of ourselves and fulfilling something, but sometimes we can be hurting ourselves. So a little tip, some tips. I don't think you should stop shopping necessarily, but a couple of tips for being able to fulfill that. One is birthday freebie bonanzas. So you can go to like almost any company and sign up for all their birthday things. And on your birthday, you can go do all their freebies. So that's like a little thing you could do for your birthday instead of buying yourself an expensive gift. Another would be shopping at thrift stores. So of course you can get things at thrift stores for a fraction of the price, you know, that you're going to find them in in major stores. And that can also still fulfill that hunter gatherer desire. Another interesting one is birthday shopping regularly. So birthdays come up and sometimes it's a chore. We got to go out and buy stuff for people. But if we make a list of all the people that we have to buy things for around the, the year, then we could schedule it out in our year. Like maybe once a month, you go shopping to enjoy yourself and actually intend to get a gift for somebody. So you're killing two birds. You're getting that feeling of shopping, which you're doing, of course, but you're doing something that you would need to do anyway. And of course, with thrift stores, consignment shops, ladies, of course, we all know consignment shops are awesome. You can do those for your kiddos. But also here's another one, making a rule for yourself, no online store. So do not click on any online store, unless you have something specific to get. I know I have a bad habit of using Amazon. Like it's my entertainment. I will go on there and I'm just browsing. And before I know it, I've bought three things. So making rules for yourself, especially on the internet, because it used to be, we had to leave to go, you know, spend money. Now we can do it in our bed. And so those are some tips for shopping. And so the next one, wine, that is a big craving. I've talked about wine. Oh, Amy, I'm sorry. Did you have any input about the shopping aspect? No, I think it's fast. The hunter gatherer point was really fascinating. Mm -hmm. And I think you're spot on with, it's so easy these days to go shopping, like you said, right from your home. So that does make it even harder. And I'm actually going to do a show about shopping addiction. I have a colleague who is doing this whole program for women with shopping addictions. And it's fascinating. She's done a lot of research on it. And I'm going to do a whole whole show about that at some point. But the next one is getting through wine o'clock. So we know wine, is, and I've talked about this before on the show, it's a big one in terms of cravings for women. And 
there's this app and it's called I Am Sober and it sends you encouraging messages to help you get through wine o'clock. So what's wine o'clock? I think we all know what it is. It's that time in the evening when we have our free time to ourselves, our kids might be asleep or whatever we've done during the day is kind of put to bed and we tend to crave our wine. So of course the question is, why are we craving it? All the things that Amy just talked about, observing what's going on with us, paying attention to the emotional need that we uh, want to get met. And really it's affirming that emotional need. And that's what that whole app called I Am Sober is. It's sending you those messages to let you know that you need to attend to some need that you're trying to fulfill with the wine. Amy? <laughs> oh, I think that, yeah, I think that's so awesome. And I think, you know, all of these points that you make, you mm-hmm. know, when it comes to food, sometimes we refer, refer to them as symbolic substitutes. But, mm-hmm. you know, I think that, you know, the shopping and the wine, you know, it really could be the same thing. We fill ourselves up with these these other things when really, you know, we're hungry or we're wanting to fill ourselves up in another area of our lives. And so I think that's where that power of reflection comes in and tries to figure out what that symbolic substitute really means. Absolutely. And I say all the time to my clients, you know, our parents were responsible, of course, for the hold that we have in us now. And yes, they were responsible, are your caregivers, whoever, for meeting those needs in your childhood. But in adulthood, they are no longer responsible. We are responsible. We are fully responsible. And we're responsible for being aware of what our holes are. We all have them and they are all different. And you need to know yourself well enough to know what your holes are. And then you need to spend the time to figure out how to fill them up for yourself. Absolutely. And I think that's one of the the most powerful things we can do for ourselves Mm -hmm. is just invest in our own our own growth, because when we really spend the time to get to know ourselves, you know, like nobody knows you better than you. Right. But when we take the time to really get to know ourselves, I think, you know, it's just, it's just so powerful and it really helps us, you know, show up as our biggest, brightest self and make our highest and best contribution to the world. It sure does. Because that self that you just talked about, that's the self that the world deserves to see. Because yes. that's why that's you your superwoman, here. right? It is. That is your superwoman. And we're all about redefining your superwoman here, which really just means discovering it and not being afraid to show it and express it to the world. Absolutely. And so, ladies, you can do this. Whatever craving it is that you are struggling with, know that it's there for a reason. Think about these causes. Go get Amy's book and understand yourself well enough and also know that you're moving steps forward. There will always be a step or two back, but you're moving forward. So you can get a hold of Amy at her website, makingpeacewiththepantry.com. Thank you so much, Amy. This has been a wonderful conversation. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. It's been great. Wonderful. So we will connect later. And this is Dr. Zoe. And I'm going to be talking about when is enough enough when it comes to relationships? I've had lots of clients and people in my life who've been dealing with this. So, and we will be back in just a minute. People ask me, how do you have so much energy? I am not a coffee drinker, but I love the benefits of matcha green tea. More antioxidants than coffee and a smooth energy, not the jittery kind that lasts me all day long. Perfect for you super moms too. I have searched the world over for that perfect matcha for my smoothies and I have found it at Kiss Me Organics. You can get it too at kissmeorganics.com. Enter the promo code Dr. Zoe, D R Z O E, for 10% off and free shipping. Experience the smooth, healthy, organic energy of matcha green tea. Kissmeorganics.com. Hi there, it's Dr. Zoe, and I just had a great conversation with Amy Barnett, making peace with the pantry about those cravings we have in our lives, those vices. And I know sometimes it can just get you down when you feel like, why can't I get over this? And so I just want to encourage you. You can, and you will. It's a process. Trust the process. Keep on going. Fall down. You get up. You do it over again. So it is real talk. Well, actually, I'm going to do a little bit of health tips. So we've been talking about cravings today, and I just wanted to point out that there are three cravings. These are food cravings that could mean a health problem. 
So the first one would be water. If you notice that you are craving a ton of water all the time, that could mean that you have some diabetes or are going pre-diabetic. So it's something you definitely want to look at. The other one is salt. If you notice you are constantly craving salt, we already get enough salt in our diet naturally. So no American should be craving salt. If you are, that could be a sign of something called Addison's disease. The other one is ice. This one fascinated me. If you are craving ice, like you need to chew it all the time, you just want it and you notice that you're getting cups of ice and just chewing it, that could point to an iron deficiency. I had that with my pregnancy. Oh, it's the worst thing ever for ice. I would eat it all day long, every day. And that can be a sign of iron deficiency. Why in the world your body craves ice when it needs iron? I wish I knew, but it's true. So right now I'm going to be doing real talk. If you're just tuning in, it's Dr. Zoe. And this is real talk where I answer questions from my listeners and I share my own musings and encouragement. Please reach out if you have some questions you'd like me to address on the show. All the questions are anonymous and I take your confidentiality seriously as if you were my own client. You can email questions to me at zoe at drzoeshaw.com or you can connect with me on any of my social medias. So I'm going to be talking about a tough one. When is enough enough when it comes to relationships? How do we know if we should leave, if we should give up, if we should pursue? And this has come up with so many of my clients right now. And, you know, I mean, it it has over the years, but it seems so concentrated right now. And so I just feel like I have to address it. And it's so tough because when we are in the forest, we can't see, we can't, and we get so bogged down emotionally by history in terms of what, what we believed was going to be with the relationship or so many things. It's hard to see clearly and logically. Sometimes seeking out help is really helpful because other people can see and share. Sometimes it can get even more confusing if you're seeking, like I have a client and she's seeking therapy from everybody. She's seeking everybody's opinion and it's just caused her to feel like I I really don't know what to do because I'm getting 10 different, you know, advice. So here's the first one. When he says he's done, believe him. And this is a hard one because I have so many women saying, well, he says that, but what if he doesn't really mean it? Or should I continue to contact him? And my answer is, and I I had this conversation with my client, no, don't contact him. He has your number. He knows how to get a hold of you. And if and when he wants to, he will. And your job right now, I'm not asking you to give up on the relationship necessarily. Meaning if you're open to it happening, when he contacts you, fine. But your job right now is to recognize that the relationship is over and what you need to do is work on moving forward for you. The reality is that you can reconcile with anyone at any time, but when you keep yourself in a place where you are moving towards and someone else is moving away, number one, emotionally, they feel that. So any connection that you have with them, any talk that you have with them, they are going to feel that energy and they are going to pull away more. When you are able to let go, then you create a totally different energy and their response may be different. The next one is when there is a major issue in a relationship or a marriage, you have to be able to address it clearly and openly. So whatever issue is going on, you need to go to your partner and you need to address it. It is not fair ever to leave your partner without them knowing why. You haven't given them a chance to rectify the situation. And let me tell you this, the majority of divorces are initiated by women in this country. And most men have no clue what in the world happened and why their wife is divorcing them. So I know a lot of women will be like, well, I told him all these years. And I know you definitely feel that, that you've been saying, you've been complaining, and now you've had enough and you're done. But what I am saying is that before you exit a relationship, You need to respect the relationship enough to be able to clearly explain whether you need to write it in a letter or have that conversation with your partner about why you are leaving the relationship or why you intend to leave the relationship. This helps everybody have closure. And this allows him to make different choices if that's something that you want to give him as an opportunity. 
And Dr. Phil always says, you have to earn your way out of a relationship or out of a marriage. And I really firmly believe that, especially if it's a marriage, you need to earn your way out. Meaning you need to feel and know when you leave that you have done every single thing you can. And now you have to take that next step. The next thing is after you've done that, when you have expressed clearly what is going on for you and why you are leaving or why you feel that you are thinking about leaving or want to leave, why the relationship isn't okay. If he is not willing to rectify, if his behavior shows that, because another big issue is that I have women that will tell me, well, he said this and he said this, and now, you know, I'm leaving. And so now he's proposed. Well, yeah, he's up in the ante because he wants to keep you. The words mean nothing. It's the behavior. And so please be very careful not to fall into, he says he loves me. He says he's going to change. He says he's going to do this and deciding that you're going to stay in a relationship that you know is not healthy. And it's not like we don't do these things either, but I'm talking to you women. And so if after you have clearly demonstrated to him everything that is important to you, is not working in the relationship. And then he is not willing to change. You've given him time, six months, a year, depending on what it is. That's the point where it's okay to say enough is enough. Now, I'm not talking about he doesn't take the trash out every week, especially when we're talking about a marriage. A marriage, it needs to be very, very, there need to be huge issues going on. I'm talking about infidelity, addiction, you know, emotional, physical abuse. Serious things need to be going on in order for you to be at that point where you're going to exit it. Otherwise, you know, a marriage is a, is a commitment and you need to be able to continually work on those things. But if you're dating and you're in that place already and there hasn't been a marriage commitment, it's time to move on. And it's time to recognize what is real and going on in the relationship, not what you want to happen. There's a saying Men marry women expecting them not to change, and they do. And women marry men expecting them to change, and they don't. So you have to recognize if you are engaged or dating and you're trying to change him, that's already a really bad sign. So those are some of my tips and some information about the steps you need to take when you're getting towards is enough enough. I actually talked about this on the Grit and Grace podcast. And I'm going to be doing some more writings about that. So thank you for tuning in today to the Dr. Zoe Show. Tune in next week and every week on Tuesdays from 12 to 1 Pacific, 3 to 4 Eastern at laradionow.com. For those who can't always listen live, check out the reruns of my show on iTunes, Google Play, Lipton, and YouTube. The show that I do today posts two weeks from today. So every, every week on Tuesday morning, I have a new show up on my podcast. I am your life and relationship coach, and I help sometimes struggling superwomen. Keep your mind in the game by redefining your superwoman. If you know a friend who may benefit from any of our topics, please spread the love and share my show. If you like my show, please show me some love with some stars that helps other people find me as well. And connect with me at drzoeshaw.com or any of my social medias at the handle Dr. Zoe Shaw. And join my free newsletter. Get a free copy of 30 Minute Life Transformation, The Secret to Getting Stuff Done by texting the word join to 38470. I look forward to speaking with you wonderful ladies on social media after the show. Have a super week. You've been listening to The Dr. Zoe Show, redefining your superwoman with your host, Dr. Zoe Shaw. Don't forget to sign up for her monthly newsletters to get encouragement, tips, and skills for keeping your mind in the superwoman game. Connect with her now at www.drzoeshaw.com. Tell your friends and subscribe to her podcast on iTunes. Join us next time for another edition of The Dr. Zoe Show.